the party was full of people. Scattered throughout the large suburban mansion were 20 and 30-somethings dressed in elaborate casual attire that was meant to look good, but not seem like they were trying to impress. They were playing pool or ping pong, watching television, eating and drinking, dancing and laughing, and everyone seemed to be having unbridled fun. A tall, thin man with dark curly hair and a handsome, open face stood in the corner of the main room and nervously looked over his shoulder at an aggressively tipsy, red-headed girl who was making it clear that she was ready for any kind of fun at the party or afterward. But the man only continued to nod absent-mindedly, obviously trying to disengage himself from a conversation that at another time he might have started on his own. The last words of an inaudible question reached his mind, and he realized he had to answer. So this is a date then? He looked at the redhead with a somewhat panicked look. Yeah, sure. Can we take your car? I, uh, probably shouldn't drive. He continued to search the room over her shoulder. Hey, listen, I don't mean to be rude, but I really need to find Jason. I was wondering if you could, uh, text me what you want to do and I'll catch up with you later. A look of surprise appeared on the red-haired girl's face. Jason? Jason Bright? He came to the party? I thought he became a monk or something. Yeah, I, uh, talked him into coming. And now I can't find him, so I really need... At that moment, a pretty blonde woman with curly hair walked by, and the man suddenly jerked slightly in her direction. Hey! Hey, Kara! Hey, Kara! The blonde turned, and a wide smile lit up her face. She nodded at the beer in his hand and raised her eyebrows expectantly. Hey, Brian, did you bring one of those beers for me? He threw her an incredulous look as if he didn't realize what she'd said and then abruptly dropped his own question. Hey, where's Jason? I went to get a beer and I haven't been able to find him since. The blonde's smile faded and she gestured to a room off to the side. He was in the entertainment room about 15 minutes ago. You can check in there. She smiled again. Why, is he your beau or something? Brian gave her an appraising look and gave a short snort of laughter. You'd like that, wouldn't you, Kara? Well, no such luck. It just took me forever to convince him to come have fun, so I'm a little nervous about him having a good time. He turned to the redhead, who seemed a little upset that her dominance over Brian had passed to the pretty blonde. Hey, listen. Really. Text me what you want to do. I need to find Jason, okay? The redhead pouted her lips and nodded her head with muted enthusiasm. Okay. I'll see you after... But Brian left before she finished, aggressively pushing his way through the crowd toward the entertainment room, where he found a dozen or so people slouched on a couch, sitting Indian-style on the floor, or sprawled around while a music video played on the big-screen TV that took up the entire room. He took a quick look around, then caught the eye of a jolly fat man who was swaying awkwardly to the beat of the music, holding a drink in one hand and potato chips in the other. Hey, bud, have you seen Jason? Jason? Yeah. Jason Bright? He was here a couple minutes ago. Oh, yeah, man. I'm pretty sure he left. Got up all of a sudden and jumped out of here like he was throwing up or something. Walked out of the room? No, man. Right out the front door. Brian stood for a minute, shaking his head slowly, trying to comprehend what the fat man had said. What? Why? What the hell happened? I don't know. When the game was over, we changed the channel to some movie and watched it for a couple of minutes, and then he just got up and left. A movie? What movie? Oh, you know, an old one with Dustin Hoffman, The Graduate. But we hardly watched it because it was at the very end when we turned on the TV. At the end? Yeah, you know, that whole wedding scene when Hoffman comes in and hits the glass and the girl runs off with him. Brian's face began to redden, starting with a faint pink hue and rapidly progressing until he looked like a tomato with human features. He then began to slowly throw words at the fat man, carefully enunciating them with increasing force and volume for maximum effect. You tuned in to a movie where the bride leaves the groom for another man, at the goddamn altar, and Jason Bright sits back and watches. The first time he's been out of his shabby little apartment in months? You're a bigger idiot than I can imagine. Jason Bright lay on his side, admiring his sleeping bride. She was breathing quietly and rhythmically, and each exhalation of air from her mouth gently ruffled the mop of straw blonde hair that fell across her face. To most observers, Penny Miller was a small, attractive woman, several pounds overweight, and with facial features too coarse to be considered classically beautiful. But here, in the rays of the morning sun, 
falling on her pure, pale skin and giving it a certain radiant translucency, she seemed to Jason like an absolute angel, a gift of love from God himself. By all accounts, Bright had been extremely successful in life up to this point. He had done well in high school, excelling in sports and academics, graduating with top grades, and then earning near-perfect grades in a double major in finance and statistics before becoming an economics major at the Chicago Business School. After that, he easily landed a job with one of Chicago's top trading firms and moved steadily up the corporate ladder, getting more and more responsibility and more and more money. But he never felt like life was working out the way he wanted it to until he met Penny. And that was because despite all his success in business and sports, he'd never had anything resembling a satisfying romantic relationship. In high school, he'd been a nervous teenager around girls, overly anxious, completely clueless about how to approach them to talk to them, let alone start a relationship. He'd gained some confidence in college when a couple of aggressive girls saw him as a good guy and didn't let his insecurities get in the way. But it still only led to a string of superficial hookups that didn't lead to anything significant in Jason's opinion. And that pattern seemed to continue in business school and for a few years at his new job. But then he met Penny, and everything changed. She was easy to be with, lively, talkative, attractive, without pretense or vanity. She wanted quiet, peaceful evenings, a house with a fence and kids, and Jason wanted her. And so, with a sense of comfortable inevitability, their relationship smoothly developed and strengthened. And so, on a warm summer evening in a small park by the lake, Jason got down on one knee and with trembling hands held out the ring to Penny, who accepted it with tears, a smile, and an enthusiastic hug. In the eight months since, plans had been made, invitations sent out, dresses chosen, and a church reserved in Penny's hometown in southern Illinois for a date that was only six days away. They drove down I-55 Highway, listening to music and chatting, with Penny occasionally texting friends or family to update them on their progress towards Centerville or to make wedding arrangements. About half an hour into the drive, she quieted down a bit, and Jason watched her gaze wistfully at the scenery passing by. After a couple minutes, he decided to break the silence. Are you okay, sweetheart? Problems with the caterer or something else? She looked back at him with a slight expression of confused surprise, as if she'd been caught doing something inappropriate. Oh no, no, it's just... I guess I was just thinking about getting home and all the ghosts and problems I left behind. Jason scowled an incredulous grimace in response. Ghosts? Problems? What are you talking about? Penny sighed melancholically and stared absent-mindedly out the window for a while before answering. Well, it's really not a big deal, Jace. But well, you know, some of my old friends and some of my family had a certain idea of who I should be with, and they're not... Be very supportive of the wedding and all that. That's about it. Wait, you mean your family doesn't like me? I thought we got along really well when they came to visit. Both times. I actually had a great time with your dad. Did I misunderstand something? Penny shook her head decisively. Oh, no, no, not at all. My parents love you. They think you're wonderful. They really do. She paused, chewing on her lower lip for a moment before continuing. But like I said, some old friends and relatives. Well, they still think that... Nah. Penny stopped and looked out the window before finishing her thought. Look, Penny. What's your point? You seem to think I should know what the problem is, but I really have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Penny let out an intermittent sigh. Look, Jace, this... this is about Kenny. Jason glanced at Penny, then shifted his gaze back to the road. What about him? I mean, it's been over between you two for about five years now, right? Why has it become an issue now? Unless you haven't told me anything. Penny shook her head and then, paradoxically, nodded her face showing a mixture of concern, confusion, and disappointment. No? Well, yeah, sort of. Look, Jace, I told you everything that was important about me and Kenny. That we got really serious in high school, that we were going to get married, and that it just, it just didn't work out. Penny paused, chewing her lip again, a look of uncertainty back on her face. Jason shrugged and raised his eyebrows in an expectant gesture before Penny continued again. To tell you the truth, a few of my friends seemed to be very interested in our, uh, relationship. They thought about them. Still do. Like some kind of romantic fairy tale. And they keep pushing me to give Kenny another chance. They tell me that he's changed, that we're meant to be together, and stuff like that. Jason pressed his lips together in thoughtfulness and subconsciously added speed, 
quickly overtaking the car in the slow lane. So, what are you trying to tell me? That I have to compete with your ex a week before our wedding? Is that what you're saying? Penny clenched her hands in annoyance and pressed them to her eyes. No, no, it's not. That's not what I'm trying to tell you at all. She lowered her hands and looked at Jason seriously, waiting for him to take his eyes off the road and look at her before starting again. It's just some of them, a few friends, especially Teresa, might try to, I don't know, try to push us together or treat you badly or something. And I just wanted you to be prepared. That's all. Teresa? Isn't she one of your bridesmaids? You asked someone who doesn't doesn't want us to get married to be in the wedding party? Isn't that a little, uh, weird? Penny frowned. Well, I understand what you're saying. But Teresa was my best friend. And I feel, I don't know, obligated to be a bridesmaid. I mean, I was at her wedding. And it would be, uh, rude, I guess, if she wasn't one of mine. She turned to face Jason and glared at him, asking him to understand her, but he only stared at her dumbly, then turned away to the road for a few moments to calm down. Finally, after several minutes of silence, he let out a long sigh and turned to Penny again, displaying the most reassuring smile he was capable of. Listen, Penny, I'm in this for the long haul. If there are people who want to complicate things, I can live with that. As long as you're on my side. As long as we both have each other's backs, what could go wrong? After all, it's just you and me and no one else can hurt us. Right? So, uh, so just stop worrying. I'll be on my best behavior, be as charming as I can, and bite my tongue when I have to. I'll do my best to make sure everyone in Centerville realizes that you made the right choice. And if I can't, so what? Their opinion means nothing in the end. All nervousness vanished from Penny's face and she leaned against Jason's shoulder with a satisfied smile as he continued to drive. By the time they pulled into Penny's childhood home, a two-story farmhouse on the outskirts of Centerville, set in a quiet neighborhood with large, unfenced yards and dominated by old maples and oaks, it was almost dusk. They'd barely made it a few feet down the driveway when Penny's mother, an exuberant woman with graying hair and a pleasant face, squealed with delight, arms outstretched, approaching her daughter like a jiggling middle-aged rocket seeking warmth from the front door. Penny, how is my beautiful girl doing? My blushing bride-to-be? She exclaimed, drawing her to her with soft hands and enveloping her in a mist of sweet perfume, kissing her cheek. She held her tightly against her for a few moments, savoring the feel of her daughter in her arms, and then reluctantly released her to turn her attention to her future son-in-law. And how are you doing, Jason? I'm so happy to see you. You look so good so handsome. She gave him a brief hug and then led them down the walkway to the door. Come on in. Daddy's waiting for you inside and dinner's almost ready. And we have a lot to talk about. Daddy was Penny's father, a quiet, serious man who rose from the couch as they entered the house to greet his daughter with a light hug and Jason with a firm handshake while mom went into the kitchen to start spreading food on the table. After a few minutes of small talk, he led them to the table and, with a look of domestic authority, showed them where to sit said a brief greeting, and nodded his head toward the food pork chops, salad, and a plate of mashed potatoes, a dinner for four that could feed ten. The conversation at dinner was almost exclusively about the wedding and was dominated by the women, who enthusiastically discussed seating arrangements, plans for dresses, photographers, music, and menus for the reception. When Penny mentioned that everyone should stand in the correct places during the ceremony, Mama Miller's face took on an expression of pained surprise as if she had suddenly remembered some unpleasant detail that needed to be taken care of, and she turned to Jason. Jason, honey, when is your daddy coming? What night? Jason set his fork aside and finished swallowing his potatoes. I'm pretty sure he's flying into St. Louis Thursday afternoon, so he should be here by Thursday night for the rehearsal dinner. Mom's face suddenly darkened and looked like she was about to cry, and her voice took on a tinge of extreme distress. Oh, Jason, I'm so sorry. I... Oh, I was afraid of this. Oh, no. Oh, God. Her words grew softer and softer as she spoke until they became a faint whisper and then disappeared altogether. Jason looked at Penny for a clue as to how to respond, but she only shrugged, so he turned to Mama Miller again and tried to catch her gaze, furrowing his brow in sympathy. Look, whatever the problem is, I don't think it's going to be a big one. I'm sure it'll be fine. Just, just tell me what's wrong. The older woman shook her head and put a hand to her mouth to hide the wrinkle on her chin that always appeared before she cried. 
and took a few moments to calm down before answering Jason. They told me last week that, that there was a mix-up and the country club wouldn't be open on Thursday. So, so I told them we could reschedule the rehearsal dinner for Wednesday. Clarice decided that would be fine too, made some calls and rescheduled the party for Thursday. Jason felt so relieved at the triviality of the problem that he even laughed out loud, then reached across the table to stroke her arm and began to comfort her. It's not a problem at all. My dad prefers to stay away from public gatherings, so he won't mind. And I'm sure the photographer and the stewards will tell him where to stand or sit on Saturday. Really, it'll be fine. Penny's mom took a deep breath and let out a quiet sigh of relief. Are you sure, Jason? I don't want anyone to feel left out. Oh, I'm very sure. Very. He'll be fine. He gave her the most conciliatory, reassuring smile. But what kind of... Er, what parties on Thursday are you talking about? I don't remember any party? He looked back and forth between Penny and her mom for clarification. Well, a bachelor and bachelorette party, of course. Isn't your best man? Your friend Brian, is he? Didn't he have a party plan? Yes, I think he did. I told him to keep it low-key. Nothing flashy. I'm not a big drinker, and I wouldn't want to throw a big send-off. But even if I did, most of my friends won't show up until Saturday for the wedding, so I didn't think it would be a bachelor party. Just a little get-together. Jason absent-mindedly rubbed his chin and looked at Penny, then back at her mom. I hadn't thought about it, but I guess Penny's having a bachelorette party? Mom glared again. Yes, Teresa's taking care of that, and she's really, really excited. I think you guys are going to have a lot of fun. Becky and Bob will be there, Susie and her husband, and of course Teresa and Tim. And lots more, I understand. All your old high school friends want to see you. Jason smiled at Mrs. Miller's enthusiasm and shifted his gaze carelessly to Penny. She stared woodenly at her mother, her face an uncomfortable, stiff mask with a drawn smile. A weak attempt to hide that this new event was a problem for her. Jason felt something stirring inside him, something unsettling. The rehearsal dinner was just beginning, and Jason already felt like leaving. For two days, he'd felt like he'd been on display to Penny Miller's old friends, not particularly looking like the new ring she wore subjected to admiring glances or squeals of delight, and occasional relatively hidden looks of vague disapproval or even resentment. And this dinner only promised more of the same. The main problem was Teresa Southern, a tall, attractive woman with a somewhat regal, officious demeanor, who sat upright at the table with her heavily tipsy husband, Tim, a thick, ruddy man with slicked back hair and lamb chops. Teresa, who'd led the cheerleading squad in high school and somehow managed to maintain her authority a decade later, was Penny's self-proclaimed best friend forever and seemed to steer the dinner conversation like a talent contest judge, determining which topics were appropriate and which jokes were funny. Jason had met Teresa the day after arriving in Centerville, and she had been an omnipresent irritant ever since, subtly, and sometimes not so subtly, manipulating wedding plans, dinners, and general entertainment, inviting or not inviting friends to this or that event, coaxing Penny to follow her ideas about appropriate attire, speech, and company. But the most annoying and disturbing event was when Teresa dragged Kenny, the high school soccer star, prom king, and Penny's former boyfriend, into the social program, including dinner and a group movie the night before. Kenny was a gruff country boy with a square jaw, a smile full of bright white teeth, thick wheat-colored hair, and a murmuring, ingratiating voice. Jason had found him affable and chatty, and perhaps he might have been relatable if he hadn't been the central figure in Teresa's apparent desire to celebrate Penny's high school past without Jason. But now Kenny was sitting next to Teresa, smiling broadly, shaking his head and giggling at every story resurrected from the group's collective history, and they all involved him and Penny, and it had become almost unbearable. So he chewed his chicken slowly as he listened to yet another story being retold in an almost feverish tone by the petite shawl from Penny's school days sitting next to Teresa. The current memory concerned a chapter of an old, apparently epic romance between Penny and Kenny. This time, the story of Kenny hiring a horse and baby carriage to take Penny to prom in style. Penny blushed. Kenny glowed with delight. And Jason felt a vague, growing sense of nausea, threatening to send some of the rubberized chicken back into his plate. Oh, and Penny was wearing that old-fashioned hooped dress. Remember? She was just gorgeous. She fluttered and twirled on the dance floor like she'd just come off the set of Gone with the Wind. She paused, almost out of breath, swallowing nervously, looking around the table, 
obviously making sure the group approved of the story before continuing, her voice even higher than before. And Kenny, he was wearing an old-style black tuxedo and a hat, and dancing this old waltz or something, after they were announced king and queen. Teresa nodded toward Penny, and gestured at her with her fork, smiling sentimentally. No one ever looked prettier or happier than you that night, girl. She looked back and forth between Penny and Kenny. You two were gorgeous. The other women at the table shouted in agreement. Penny blushed nervously, and Kenny glared, and for once he had nothing to add to the growing cacophony of voices describing the different perspectives on that particular dance on that particular prom night. By then, Jason was completely lost in his own thoughts, trying his best to disengage himself from the ongoing conversation to maintain some sense of calm. He looked around the room, noticed Penny's parents at another table, and wished he'd sat with them instead of Penny's friends. For a moment, he noticed the decorations and wondered why Penny had chosen green and yellow, even though her favorite color was royal blue. But then he realized that those were the Centerville High School colors Teresa had chosen. Finally, he returned his gaze to the animated faces of the men and women at his table, suddenly experiencing an overwhelming sense of isolation, an outsider at his own party. I'm sorry, they may have gotten a little carried away. He barely heard the voice over the noise and his own detachment from the conversation. He turned to his right to meet his gaze with the speaker, a plump, freckled woman with brown curly hair, squinted eyes, and a crooked smile. Huh? What did you say? She nodded across the table toward Teresa. I'm sorry she kind of took over everything. It's just, well, she knows everyone here so well, and they're all so close. I don't think she wanted to cut you out of everything. Jason felt the tension subside and smiled. Yeah, I understand that. I think I do. It's just a little hard to join her when I don't know any of the stories. And, I guess I'm thinking about other things. The brunette continued to smile. Like about your upcoming wedding? Jason snorted with laughter. Yeah, like, well, my name is Betsy. Betsy Palmer. I don't know if you remember. Jason interrupted. Yes, yes, I met you yesterday. At the mall. I remember. They were still engaged in casual, introductory conversation for a few more minutes. When from across the table, Jason heard his name mentioned in some question. Looking around, he realized with slight bewilderment that Teresa was addressing him. I'm sorry, Teresa. What did you say there? I didn't hear you. Teresa smiled serenely at Jason. I asked, she began, emphasizing the word asked, with a tinge of annoyance at having to repeat the question. If you could tell the rest of us exactly what you do, it seemed to Penny that you'd rather explain. Feeling the blood rush to his face from the unexpected attention, Jason began to stammer as he tried to explain. Well, I, uh, compile and manipulate economic models using a variety of new and advanced analytical techniques to help our firm make investment and marketing recommendations for our clients. Everyone stared at him with blank stares in response to his answer. Well, that's clear as mud, Kenny stated, half laughing. Jason looked at Penny, who smiled at him and nodded her head encouraging him to continue explaining. He smiled back and, still a little embarrassed, tried again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's really not that complicated. I'm just mathematically evaluating the situation to help our clients and other companies and investment institutions to figure out what to do with their products or whether they should issue stock and things like that. This explanation elicited murmurs, half smiles and nods, but the room was suddenly quiet and Jason felt an urgent need to fill the air. He took a deep breath, pulled on his best fake smile, and turned in what he hoped was an interested voice to Kenny, who seemed more than surprised to hear Jason's question. So, uh, Kenny. Penny tells me you work at the Ford dealership we drove past when we came into town. Do you like the job? Is it a good job? Kenny raised his eyebrows, which gave away his suspiciousness, and began to answer in a quiet and slow voice, choosing his words carefully. Yeah, yeah, it's a good job. I think it is. It's a lot of work sometimes, but I, I like it. So you're in sales? Selling cars? Kenny's tone changed abruptly. His answer was harsh, tinged with anger and resentment. No, no, I'm not a salesman, he replied, emphasizing the word not through clenched teeth. I'm one of the managers. I'm not just in the business of selling cars. Much more. There was an awkward, embarrassed silence, and Jason felt all eyes in the room on him sensing that he had made a terrible social mistake, but not realizing what it was or what exactly to do about it. I'm sorry, I... I didn't mean anything by it. I'm sorry. 
He stuttered, opening his hands in a peace sign and smiling weakly. He was somewhat relieved when Kenny smiled back and muttered, It's okay. Tightly pressed together on the double bed in Penny's old bedroom, with moonlight streaming in through the open window and casting ill-defined, ghostly shadows, Penny and Jason lay in each other's arms, recounting the events of the evening and conducting a post-mortem of the rehearsal dinner. They both agreed that it had been more than they had realized. Too much food, too many people, too much noise, and too, too much tension. What was that cool asshole's reaction to being asked if he sells cars? He practically exploded in there. I wanted to melt in my chair, and I'm sure I wasn't the only one. Penny pressed her lips together in thoughtfulness and stared unseeingly at the ceiling, formulating a response. Kenny has some baggage, Jace. You have to realize that. It's not his fault he blew up. Not really. Jason rolled over onto his side and looked intently at Penny. His eyebrows furrowed in concern and frustration. He interrupted her with a harsh, businesslike voice, from which the warmth had faded away, replaced by irritation and annoyance. Wait, are you saying this is my fault? Honestly, I don't understand what I did that was so bad. Seriously, I didn't realize he'd turn out to be so damn sensitive. I wasn't trying to make him look or feel bad or make a scene. I was just trying to make conversation by asking a completely frivolous question. Penny gave Jason a half-smile and turned to face him, lifting a hand to stroke his cheek as she formulated a response. Jace, it's not your fault at all, kid. It's just that you have to understand Kenny, his insecurities. Come on, Penny. We all have insecurities, but we have to live with them. You can't just blow up every time someone says something that bothers you. He didn't really explode that much, she started to reply. Jason raised his eyebrows incredulously and had already opened his mouth to interrupt her. But Penny changed tact. Listen, here's the deal. Kenny's always been the big man on campus, the best athlete, the most popular guy, all that kind of stuff. But all of that ended after graduation. He didn't get the soccer scholarship he wanted, which meant he didn't get into college or get the job he wanted. Or the girl he wanted. Jason interrupted him sharply. Or the girl he wanted. Don't get mad about my friends, please. Jason wrinkled his nose slightly and smiled weakly. I'm not mad. Really. I just feel like, I don't know, that you still have a connection with Kenny. I almost feel like I should. Penny raised her eyebrows. Like you owe what? I don't know. Compete for you or something. It's driving me crazy, I guess. Penny's facial expression turned incredulous, her mouth opening in surprise before she replied. Come on, you don't have to compete for me. I'm yours. You know that. Why do you get that impression? Jason pressed his lips together and furrowed his brows before giving a hesitant, confused answer. I don't know. I guess. I guess when Kenny showed up with that girl last night and tonight, I thought he was trying to make you jealous. And from the way you reacted, it looked like it worked. Like you were upset that he was paying attention to another girl or something. I know you were very serious, but it seems like, at least for Kenny, he never got over his feelings. Penny pressed her lips together in a thoughtful expression before replying, her speech deliberate, her words carefully chosen. Listen, Jason, you know that Kenny and I have been together for a long time, right? From when I was a freshman in high school until a couple years after I graduated? Jason nodded his head. Yeah, you told me that. Well, I told you we were thinking about getting married, and it's true. We did plan it. We had a honeymoon and everything. But after I graduated, things fell apart a little bit. Kenny wasn't really interested in white-collar jobs. He just wanted to stay here and live the small-town life and do small-town things. And I wanted to go to college and get some kind of degree. We had a few disagreements, but eventually I left for college and he stayed here. We were still together. I'd come up on weekends. We'd spend holidays together. But he started getting jealous. Jason shrugged in acknowledgement. I know the feeling. Penny smiled and continued. He started coming to campus and kind of catching up with me at off hours. He said he was just trying to surprise me, but really he was testing me. In fact, a couple times I caught him blatantly spying on me. Anyway, it all ended one night in the library. I was in a study group and was sorting through some essay questions with a guy when he put his hand on mine. Sort of flirting, but nothing much. Turns out Kenny was hiding behind some bookshelves. He came out and told the guy to get his hands off me. I was shocked, and Kenny and I got into a huge fight right in the library. I ended up taking the ring off and throwing it at him told him not to hit on me again and to stay away. Ha, huh, you never told me that before. Was that it then? Was it over at that point? Well, we talked on the phone and went out once or twice after that. 
but it wasn't the same. I moved on, met you, and here we are. She wrapped her arms around Jason and pulled him tightly to her, pressed her lips to his ear and whispered, And now it's just you and me here. Kenny's just an old friend. Okay, baby? Okay? He felt her rhythmic breathing on his chest a few minutes later as she fell asleep, and he was left lying sleepless, staring up at the ceiling. John Raymond Bright was a stout man with a weathered face with a square jaw and hair the color of salt and pepper cut into a bob. He sat between his son and Jason's best man, Brian Hewitt, a handsome and stout man with curly hair and a mischievous smile, at the only bar in Centerville that served food. It was a sports bar, where rock and roll played loud enough to keep the conversation strained. Jason described the events of the week, including Kenny's temper tantrum during the rehearsal dinner, and rubbed the stubble on his head with a meaty hand. God, what a freak, he said, in a loud, gravelly, no-holds-barred voice, reaching for his beer. I mean, he sounds like a total freak. Brian laughed in agreement and took a bite out of his hamburger, and Jason just shrugged. Yeah, maybe. But anyway, Dad, you didn't miss much. I'm sure you'd find it pretty boring. Yeah, I guess so, said John, finishing his fries. You'd probably end up embarrassing yourself anyway, so it's okay. Jason started to object, but John stopped him with a raised hand. It's okay, Jace. We both know that this, he pointed to the bar scene surrounding them, is the best I can do. And Jason sipped his beer and swirled it around in his mouth before swallowing. Yeah, I'm okay with that too, Dad. Better than last night anyway. John Bright looked at his son carefully, then gestured toward the bar again. Is that all you wanted for your bachelor party? A couple hours in a sports bar eating hamburgers with that smiling fool and your old man? No dancing girls or anything? Jason shook his head vigorously. No, Dad, it's okay. It's just the way it is. And honestly... Even if I wanted dancing girls or something, well, it's a small town and rumors would spread. I wouldn't want to start my marriage off on the wrong foot, you know. Yeah, I know. John nodded, taking a bite out of his hamburger. I know. The three men spent another hour at the bar, talking, joking, drinking beer, and watching the soccer game on the big screen TV behind the bar before the conversation dried up and they mutually decided to call it a night. In the parking lot, Jason waved goodbye to Brian and got behind the wheel of his car, while his father grunted and moved into the passenger seat. Both men seemed immersed in their own thoughts as Jason drove the car out of the parking lot and down the highway to John's hotel. Neither spoke, both stared at the highway, both wearing masks of people who don't really see anything. After a few minutes, however, John began to fidget. He opened his mouth several times, cleared his throat, and glanced at Jason, showing all the typical signs of wanting to talk but not really saying anything. Finally, a mile or two before the hotel, John officially broke the silence. Big day on Saturday, son. Big day. You ready? Jason cast a brief glance at his father, then shifted his eyes back to the road. I'm ready, Dad. Really ready. In fact, I can't wait to get married. To be a husband, to be a father. You're going to be a great son. Wonderful. John took his gaze away from his son, and his voice softened and took on an awkward tone precisely a mumble. Sure, sure, much better than I was. Jason quickly looked back at his father. Now, Dad. No, no, son, it's true. John raised his hand to interrupt Jason. We both know I've been a shitty father. We both know that. Hell, your mother and I split up when you were what? Three years old? And I barely saw you until... John paused for a moment, looking away and taking a couple deep breaths. No, you had a hard time, son when your mom was in a car accident and you stayed with me. Really hard. In the darkness, Jason could make out his father bringing his right hand up to his eyes to wipe something away, then cleared his throat and swallowed hard a few times before starting again. So, I'm happy for you, son. Damn happy you have a girl you love. Happy that I can be here to see it. Jason nodded his head as he pulled into the hotel parking lot and stopped the car, then turned to look at his father. Dad, I'm glad you're here too. Really glad. You are my family. I couldn't have done it without you. John Bright turned to face his son, and for the first time in his life, Jason saw the tears on his father's cheeks and heard his rough, gravelly voice break as he spoke. Look, son, I just want you to know how sorry I am that after your mother died, you were left with a scoundrel like me. Hell, Jason, I could barely take care of myself, let alone an 11 year old boy. John paused to wipe away his tears, but now they were streaming down his face 
and his voice was higher and more ragged as he finished his thought. I... I want you to know how... how much I loved having you around, even if it didn't feel that way at first. How much I loved watching you play those games and go to school. God, you were such a hard worker, working part-time and still getting great grades. And the honors you got and the college scholarship you got. And then, uh, then you worked your ass off again. And then you found this great job. I just, I just want you to know that you deserve to marry a great girl. And that, that I'm damn proud of you, son. Damn proud. And now Jason was crying too. And both men sat in silence each resting his right hand on the other's left shoulder and looking at each other without a shadow of discomfort until John finally opened the door and headed across the half-lit parking lot to his motel room. Teresa Jones's parents owned perhaps the largest house in Centerville, a huge Georgian mansion on several acres of land with half a dozen bedrooms, a recreation room, a library, and a huge living room. That evening, the living room had been taken over by a dozen young women who were now lounging on the sofa or sitting cross-legged on the floor, giggling, telling stories, drinking wine, and squealing with delight and embarrassment as the birthday girl opened her gifts. Penny, being the bride-to-be and the celebrant, was smiling just as wide and laughing just as loudly as everyone else present. Surrounded by a pile of gifts and lingerie, she was in her element and felt at ease and at ease with her old friends. But just at that moment, a drunken request to model some of the lingerie turned into a demanding shouting match that was picked up by all the women. Penny, blushing furiously and shaking her head, did her best to talk them out of it until she realized they weren't going to be refused. With embarrassed hesitation, she took the donated linens and headed down the hall to the only bedroom on the main floor. She spread the outfits out on the bed and stroked her cheek thoughtfully, trying to decide which one would be the least humiliating, finally settling on the baby dollar that came with the see-through wrap, the most modest one possible. She took her time putting it on and examining herself from every angle in the floor-to-ceiling mirror before returning to the hallway to an anxious flock of noisy women who welcomed her back with the kind of shouts, hooting, and hollering that usually occurred in a strip club. Penny laughed nervously, and though embarrassed, tried to play her part properly, posing as attractively as possible in front of the rowdy women. Most of the women responded with laughter and applause, but Teresa, more than a little tipsy, began shouting for more. Show us another one, Penny! Show us another one. Not surprisingly, her request was picked up by the rest of the women, but this time, Penny held firm and shook her head, trying her best to kindly refuse the women, who let out a disappointed groan as she eventually retreated down the hall to the bedroom. And just as Penny entered the bedroom, there was a knock on the front door, and then Teresa's laughter and squeals heralded the arrival of three men carrying conciliatory gifts of champagne and vodka to appease the hostess for crashing the party. With minimal objections, Teresa led them into the room where the first two, Bill Jenkins, a short, pot-bellied man with a cherubic face and horn-rimmed glasses, and Tom Anders, a taller and leaner version of Bill, but with even less facial hair, walked to the back of the room to chat with their girlfriends. The third man was Kenny Bailey, who immediately asked Teresa where Penny was, quietly explaining that he had brought her a gift he wanted to give her before the wedding. When Teresa said that Penny was changing in the bedroom and would be out soon, Kenny immediately began organizing the entire group into a choir that would sing the school fight song for Penny when she returned. But upon returning to the bedroom, Penny heard additional noise as the men appeared and assumed it was just the women playing another game or telling some particularly crude joke. Her return to the family room was delayed by the nagging thought that she was acting like a stick in the mud, and she began discussing with herself whether she should give the girls what they wanted and model some rougher underwear. In the end, she decided to have some fun and go all the way. She burst into the room with a giggle. To her disappointment, she noticed a complete lack of reaction from the audience. The women stood with surprised or even shocked faces, saying nothing, some of them just opening and closing their mouths, and some of them almost frantically pointing at something or someone at the edge of the room. And that someone was three men. Bill and Tom stood with their mouths open, with Bill's glass slipping out of his hands and shattering on the floor and Tom nervously wiping sweat from his forehead. Kenny grinned like a Cheshire cat and nodded lustfully, then began a slow, rhythmic clapping of hands in appreciation. Penny cried out loudly, then turned and ran down the hallway to the bedroom. She lay on the bed, staring at the ceiling, frozen with embarrassment, for about half an hour until Teresa came in to gently persuade her to return to the party. By the time Penny returned to the living room, there were only a few girls left sitting around the coffee table, finishing the rest of their wine and talking quietly. 
Kenny was still there, half reclining on the couch with his usual mischievous grin. He waved at her, and she reluctantly made her way through the obstacle course of furniture and presents, groaning as she sat down next to him, covering her eyes with her hands and resting her elbows on her knees. God, that was so, so humiliating. I just can't believe it happened. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Kenny laughed encouragingly, patted her back and leaned over to whisper. If it's any consolation, I'll never forget it either. Honestly, I only wish I had a camera to capture this moment for posterity. Penny covered her face and looked at Kenny, throwing him a brief look of unrestrained disgust, but his smirk turned into an indignant grin, and she laughed and leaned back relaxedly on the back of the couch. Well, I should have known you had that attitude, she stated with mock indignation, playfully punching him on the shoulder. Seriously, someone should have warned me about you breaking into the party. I was terrified. In response, Kenny shrugged, laughed, and made a big open-armed gesture toward Penny and the other girls. Surprise is my secret weapon. Without it, look how many wonderful things I'd miss out on. The two exes and the remnants of the party told jokes and racy stories for an hour until the conversation became quiet and contemplative. Finally, Penny yawned and stretched before declaring that she wanted to go to bed and should go home, and Teresa hesitantly got up to get her keys in response. But Kenny laughed at Teresa's tentative attempts to get up and insisted on driving Penny home, to which Penny enthusiastically agreed. Teresa smiled and nodded, then sank awkwardly onto the couch, watching the two leave together with approval. Conversation during the ride home was light and casual, full of observations on the dating and marriage habits of their old friends and reminiscences of days and events of years past. Two blocks from Penny's house, Kenny pulled off the road and parked the car near the tall hedge that blocked it from the windows of the houses. What? What are we doing here? Penny's voice sounded suspicious. I... I have something for you, replied Kenny, unbuckling his seatbelt and turned to her, pulling her closer. Penny raised her hand to stop him and shook her head decisively. No, Kenny. No. I'm getting married in two days, and I'm not going to park here and whisper with you for old time's sake. It's just not... She stopped abruptly, noticing Kenny holding out a small wooden box with stains and slightly rusted hinges, offering it as a gift. What? What's this? She asked. Open it. Kenny's voice was soft but insistent. Please. She reached out and carefully opened the box, looking at the contents in the dim light of the car with surprise. This is... Wait. This can't be... She muttered, slowly, reverently pulling out an opal pendant suspended on a thin gold chain, and her face colored with surprise and joy. How? How? I dived for it many times but could never find it. Then I ordered the pond drained and searched for it in the mud until I found it. When, two years ago, in the summer, Penny began awkwardly working the clasp, trembling fingers careful not to damage the fragile metal. Opening it, she held the necklace out in front of her, admiring it fondly in the dim light. Why, why have you waited until now? Her voice was so distant, breathy, like a little girl seeing magic for the first time. I had this this crazy idea that somehow we'd see each other, and maybe, I don't know, maybe get back together. So I was saving it, saving it for that moment. But, well, you got engaged, and that put an end to those plans. So I figured I could give it to you now, before you got married. Penny lifted the chain around her neck and tried to fasten the clasp. Here, there you are, he said softly. Thank you. She breathed heavily holding the pendant with her right hand as if it held life itself. I love you. I've always loved you. No. No, you haven't. I... I'm getting married, Kenny. I'm getting married in two days and I can't... can't do this. She reached behind her back, opened the door awkwardly, and tumbled out of the car, falling to the ground. She got up quickly, still shaking her head, and ran toward the house, disappearing into the darkness. Twelve hours later, Penny stood on a small stool in the middle of the living room, mute and motionless like a living statue, draped in a flowing white-on-white -white wedding dress while her mother fussed around her, pulling up the sleeves, tucking the folds of fabric, making sure the dress fit perfectly. You certainly aren't saying much this morning, dear. Are you all right? Penny let out a loud, unsure sigh. Yes, Mommy, I'm fine. Mrs. Miller cast her daughter a long, hesitant, appraising look. You don't seem fine. Is everything okay with Jason? Penny looked down with an expression of sudden panic on her face. Of course he's okay. Why, 
Why would he be upset? Did he say something to you? Did he seem angry to you this morning? No. No, honey. It's just that you seem so... so quiet that I thought maybe you talked or something. I thought that maybe, uh... maybe he was upset that we... that your dad and I insisted that he sleep somewhere else the night before the wedding. I think it's a lot to ask. And maybe we shouldn't have done it. But we just think it's... uh... it's kind of wrong. But if it's a big problem, if it's causing problems... He can sleep here tonight, honey. Penny let out a long sigh, and her body relaxed as she absently rubbed the opal pendant she wore around her neck. No, Mom. He... he wouldn't mind. He wouldn't mind sleeping separately all week if that's what you wanted. Jason. Jason's a good guy. Respectful. Mrs. Miller grumbled some more, but continued to look at her daughter with a restrained gaze. What is it? What do you have there, honey? She asked, nodding her head toward Penny's neck. What? asked Penny guiltily, abruptly letting go of the pendant as if it had suddenly become unbearably hot. This, this chain and stone, what is it? I've never seen it before, and now you're wearing it like it's a prized possession. Did Jason give it to you? Penny pressed her lips together, delaying her answer for a moment. Kenny, Kenny gave it to me. Mrs. Miller suddenly stopped fiddling with the dress and took a step back from Penny, resting her hands on her hips in disapproval. You're accepting gifts from old boyfriends now? From a woman who's getting married tomorrow? Her tone was stern, accusing, and Penny responded by mirroring her mother's gesture. Hands on hips, determined, serious face. It's different, mother. It's... She said, touching the stone. This is the pendant Kenny gave me for my 16th birthday. What? The one you dropped overboard while canoeing the day after you got it? That one? I thought it was lost forever. Penny smiled a distant look coming to her eyes as she rolled the pendant over in her fingers. He... he found it for me. He drained the pond and found it. He gave it to me. Gave it back to me last night, Mom. I think... uh... I think it's a wonderful gesture. Don't you? Mrs. Miller snorted. I think it's a gift from an old boyfriend who still cares for you. That's what I think. And I think you'd better be damn careful with that penny boy. Damn careful. He's a real charmer. A real charmer and you have a good man you're marrying tomorrow. Don't bring an old flame into your marriage, honey. It's not a good thing. Don't do it. Penny frowned and answered her mother in a sharper, slightly annoyed tone. Why do you hate Kenny so much, Mom? You've always treated him down, like he was never good enough for me. Everyone around here loves him except you. Why is that? Mrs. Miller stepped toward her daughter and gently took her left hand with both of her own. Oh, honey, I like Kenny. I like him a lot. And, and I wouldn't mind you being with him if that's what you really wanted. All I want is your happiness, honey, that's all. And if you wanted to marry Kenny, that would be fine. But, uh, but I have to tell you, I've always been worried about him. Worried that he didn't have the same goals in life that you do. He's a charmer, like I said. A boy who can create a great romantic scene for a night or a moment. But he doesn't have the ambition to do the day-to-day -day work of making a comfortable life for his family. Penny frowned. Is that why you marry someone, Mom? If he can make you comfortable? Is that why you married Daddy? Mrs. Miller smiled. No, honey. I married your father because I love him, and he loves me. But one of the reasons I love him is because he takes care of me every day. He works hard for me and gives me the life I want. If Kenny was what you wanted, him and the life he would provide for you, then everything would be fine, just fine. But I have to say I'm glad you have Jason. He's a good man who will take care of you. He'll make you happy for a long time. Penny nodded and shrugged. I know that, Mom. He's a wonderful man, and I love him. It's just... It's just that I guess I've always had feelings for Kenny, and... Well, being at home with him right now, it's kind of freaking me out. You know? It's hard to completely bury an old relationship. Mrs. Miller looked at Penny with sympathy and concern. I understand, baby, I do. But you need to get your head in order. You're getting married tomorrow, dear. You're marrying a fine young man who deserves the very best. Remember that. Penny nodded absent-mindedly in agreement as she continued to absent-mindedly run her fingers over the pendant. That night, Penny had been lying in bed for over an hour, staring at the shadows cast by the dim light of the moon, when she first heard the music. At first it was so quiet that she couldn't tell where it was coming from. But as it grew stronger, a strange realization came to her that the music was coming from outside her bedroom. She carefully got out of bed and shuffled over to the window, where she saw a group of five musicians gathered on the lawn. 
two guitarists, a bassist, and a clarinetist playing an uneven, out-of-tune version of Elvis's hit, I Can't Help Falling in Love With You. Ah. She half expected her friends to pull some kind of pre-wedding prank and laughed as she opened the window to chase the band away. But as she poked her head out into the night air, there was some movement to her right. She turned and in the dim light was able to make out the figure of Kenny sitting cross-legged on the roof above the porch, just a little away from the window. He smiled broadly and began humming the words of the song along with the band. Penny froze in place, seemingly unable to move or speak, listening with her mouth open to Kenny's surprised declaration of love when she heard her father call out to her through the bedroom door. Hey, Penny, what's that noise? Is something going on in there? Penny jerked away from the window and yelled through the door. No, Dad, it's... it's just a prank. Some guy's playing music on the lawn, that's all. Well, the hell with them. It's past midnight, damn it. I'll go over there and chase them away. The realization that her father might see Kenny on the roof threw her into a panic, so she stuck her head back out the window and told him to hide. Where? he asked, spreading his arms out in a questioning gesture. Seeing no reasonable place to hide, and realizing that the path back to the lawn was winding enough that he would surely be on the lawn the moment her father opened the front door, Penny turned to Kenny, gritted her teeth, and headed towards her bedroom, hissing softly. Quick, come here. Hurry up. Kenny responded readily and smiled, climbing through the window and closing it softly behind him before turning to face Penny. Hi, Penny. Funny to meet you here, he said with aplomb. She tried to keep a stern, disgruntled, indignant expression on her face, but his greeting completely disarmed her, and she could only laugh before sitting down on the bed and shaking her head. God, Kenny, you're going to get me in so much trouble. Kenny leaned back carelessly next to her, still smiling, leaning back against the headboard of the bed and clasping his hands behind his head. With an angel face like that, you can get out of any mess, baby, any kind of trouble. You're such an asshole, Kenny. I wouldn't say that, baby. You know I mean it. He nodded his head and raised his eyebrows for emphasis. Then his eyes caught the pendant around her neck, and he gestured at it. You, you're wearing an opal. Penny lifted it with her hand and looked down at it, then returned her gaze to Kenny. Yes, yes, I do wear one. It's a very sweet gesture. A lovely gesture for a friend, Kenny. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that what we are, Pen? Friends? Because the truth is, I feel differently about you. What I said last night? I meant it. I love you, Penny, he said in a husky, huffing voice. I love you too, she replied. When Penny awoke, she was greeted by the soft snoring of Kenny Bailey lying on his side and her mother's voice coming through the doorway. Penny, darling, it's time for you to get up, honey. It's getting late. Penny, in a sudden panic, slapped Kenny's shoulder several times to wake him up and then quickly covered his mouth with her hands as he spoke, gesturing frantically toward the bedroom door and his mother's voice. Penny, did you hear me? Yes, Mom, I'll be right out. Honey, I have your dress here. Let me get it and put it on your bed so you can put it on when you're ready. Wait! Wait, Mom! Penny practically screamed, jumping up from the bed and heading for the door, picking up her nightgown and wrapping it around her torso. Don't come in. I've got... I... I've got really bad gas. I think... Don't... Don't... Her mother's voice took on an incredulous tinge as she started to open the door. What? Don't be silly. I'll just come in. Put the dress on your bed and... No, Mom! Penny shouted, slamming her shoulder against the door to keep it from opening fully, and then came face to face with her stunned mother, who was still standing in the hallway, blocking the way into the bedroom of her clearly disturbed daughter, who seemed to be mumbling something incoherently. Seriously, Mom, it's just really bad in here. Really bad, I can barely stand it myself and... Well, it's just so, so weirdly awkward, you know, and, uh, I'm going to go downstairs now and I can put my dress on. During her incoherent monologue, Penny glanced back and forth at Kenny, who was silently rummaging around the room, gathering his shirt and underwear, but unable to find his pants. Penny angrily ordered him to leave, and Kenny ended up swinging open the window and practically jumping out through it, leaping from the roof onto the lawn below, fleeing the house and the neighborhood in just his boxer shorts. During his escape, Penny managed to maintain her odd conversation by constantly referring to the relatively toxic atmosphere she had created in her bedroom, essentially forcing her mother to stay in the hallway until she was sure Kenny had safely left the room. At that moment, the tone of her voice changed, and she opened the door abruptly, inviting her mother in. 
Okay, Mom, if you insist, you can come in, but I warned you. She briskly strode across the room to close the window, and noticing Kenny's pants by the dressing table, discreetly shoved them under the bed. Meanwhile, her completely confused mother slowly crept into the room, sniffing the air cautiously before allowing herself to take a deep breath. Penny, I don't know what you're talking about. It smells wonderful in here. Penny smiled nervously at her mother. Really? I think it smells awful. It must be the nervous tension of the wedding day. Yeah, yeah, I guess so, said her mother with vague concern. Penny sat in a stiff, upholstered, straight-backed chair in the preparation room adjoining the chapel. Her immaculate wedding dress flowed around her in perfect white waves. Her hair was arranged in elegant romantic ringlets. Her hands were folded in her lap, and she was staring blankly out the window. At that moment, she heard the sound of the door opening and the quiet sound of footsteps on the carpet. Please, please. I'd like to be alone for a few minutes, stated Penny, not checking to see who had come in. And then her mother's voice reached her, soft and gentle, loving and kind. It's me, Penny. Mrs. Miller sat quietly in the chair across from her, looking intently at her daughter, a look of pain and sympathy on her face. In her hands, she held Kenny's neatly folded jeans and his wallet. Pen, honey, she said, picking up the jeans. I found them under your bed. Do you... do you want to talk about it? Penny stared at them dumbly for a while, then burst into tears. Oh, oh my God, Mom. What, what am I going to do? I, I don't know what to do. Penny's mom put her jeans on the floor, pulled her chair closer to Penny, and took both of her hands, gazing intently into her face as she spoke. Penny, honey, what do you want, sweetheart? Who do you want? Because that's, that's all that matters. I, it's hard for me to say what I want. I feel like I'm at war with myself, mom. When I'm with Jason, everything feels right. Everything about him is so, so perfect. But Kenny, Kenny has taken over my heart and I can't let him go. Penny bit her lip, her worried expression darkening even more, and fresh tears drew new paths on her makeup. Oh, Mom, this is just going to kill Jason. How, how do I do this? Mrs. Miller reached up and brushed a tear from Penny's cheek, looking at her daughter with love and concern. Well, honey, I don't know exactly what to tell you, but I know you can do it. And no matter what, you know you have my support and my love. And my blessing, if that matters. Jason Bright stood in the groom's preparation room, barely overcoming his excitement to stand still, while Brian Hewitt carefully adjusted his tuxedo, brushed off the lint, adjusted his tie, and made sure the groom was absolutely flawless. While Brian was adjusting his tie, Mrs. Miller and Penny entered the room, and Jason's face broke into a wide, excited smile, which immediately turned into a mask of concern when he saw the distressed expression on Penny's face, accentuated by red eyes and tear tracks. Penny... What's wrong, honey? Are you okay? He stepped away from Brian and took two steps toward Penny, intending to hug her. But Penny stopped his movement with a raised hand. Jason, Jason, we need to talk, she said simply as Mrs. Miller gestured for Brian to follow her out of the room. Of course, sweetheart. Of course. Tell me, what's wrong? Penny shook her head slightly and turned away from Jason, fresh tears appearing in her eyes. Without turning around, she spoke again, quietly, hesitantly, in a voice full of pain and regret. Jason, I have bad news, very bad news. And, and I don't know exactly how. Honey, whatever it is, it's going to be okay, Jason started to say, taking a step forward. But Penny raised her hand again and moved her gaze straight to him, now looking him straight in the eye. Please, Jason, let me finish. Because this isn't, this really isn't going to be good. Penny swallowed hard twice, looked away, and then back at Jason before starting again. Jason, I can't, I can't marry you. I'm sorry. I love you, and I know you love me, but I just can't do it. Her voice was devoid of emotion, becoming almost robotic, as if it was the only way she could get her point across without breaking down. Jason shook his head and faked a smile that should have been reassuring, but the fear and vulnerability behind it only made his heart ache more. Penny, honey, if you're getting cold feet, I understand. We can, we can put this off. We can take our time and... Penny shook her head violently, hot tears streaming down her face, which had taken on a determined look. No, Jason, no. I can't marry you now. I can't marry you ever. It would be a mistake for both of us. I can't be your wife, Jason. I just can't. 
I'm so, so sorry. Jason spread his hands in a pleading gesture and took another step forward. But Penny, he started to say, but she only sobbed, taking off her wedding ring and handing it to Jason with a trembling hand. And then, gasping in pain, she turned away from him abruptly and stumbled out of the room, tripping over her dress. John Bright was standing in the foyer of the church, not far from the chapel, when the pandemonium began. He saw Penny's mother come out of one of the preparation rooms with Brian Hewitt and say something earnest, her somber face not in keeping with what he expected to see from the mother of the bride on her wedding day. While she was talking, several women managed to sneak up and overhear their conversation until they apparently caught the gist of it, at which point they began thrashing around the church to set off a chain reaction of gossip. Soon both men and women were animatedly discussing what was going on, tugging on the sleeve of any passerby to elicit more information. By this time, Brian's conversation with Mrs. Miller was almost over and had become decidedly unpleasant. Brian blushed, his nostrils flared as he gave Penny's mother some firm, final opinion, then turned and headed back to the groom's room. John took a few quick steps toward him. Hey, Brian, what's going on? Brian looked at John and shook his head in disgust. It's off, he said emphatically. The wedding's off. Wait, what? That can't be, replied John, heading with Brian to the ready room. But all his doubts about the veracity of Brian's information were dispelled when he saw his son stagger out of the room with anguish on his face. His tuxedo was disheveled. His previously perfectly combed hair was now a mess, and his eyes were wet with tears. Oh, oh my God, son. Son, what, what happened? Jason could only stare at his father and shake his head, effectively rendered speechless by the devastating news his ex fiance had just given him. At that moment, Kenny Bailey burst into the church without coat or tie, half-dressed in his suit pants and unbuttoned white shirt, and demanded the attention of the first small, muscular woman in a too-big formal dress who caught his eye. Where is she? The woman nodded excitedly toward the archway leading to the reception hall, and Kenny, realizing this, hurried in the same direction. John watched the scene, squinting his eyes, looked back at Brian, who had a look of disgust on his face, then at Jason, who still looked dazed and incoherent, and at the archway through which Kenny had disappeared. John's face turned red, and he began clenching and unclenching his fists, pushing his way through the crowd toward the reception hall until he reached the hall itself. There, amidst a crowd of happy, chattering spectators, Kenny knelt down in front of Penny, who, still in her wedding dress, sat in a straight-backed chair and nodded happily through dried tears as Kenny held her hands and spoke to her with a broad, reassuring smile. Shaking with overwhelming rage, John cast a long, angry glance at the couple and exploded. What is this shit? Those words caught the attention of the entire crowd, who as one turned to look at John with surprise and disgust. But their disapproval didn't faze John. You mean to tell me that this... that my son's heart is broken because of this loser? He gestured at Kenny, an incredulous expression on his face. Penny began to cry again, and Kenny, gritting his teeth, began to rise while off to the side, Penny's father quickly made his way through the crowd to John. Look, I'm asking all of you who seem to be having so much fun here. I'm asking you if it's true that this bitch... As soon as the word bitch left John's mouth, Penny's father unclenched his fist, and the blow came like lightning to the corner of John's mouth, causing him to stagger and take a step back. John wiped his mouth with his hand and looked at the blood before turning his attention back to Penny's father. A murderous expression frozen in his eyes, and his mouth set in a grim, bloody smile. Clenching his fists, he strode toward Mr. Miller, who, clearly surprised that his punch had had no effect on John, began to back away awkwardly. But just as John came within striking distance, Jason's voice, tired but firm and insistent, stopped him. Dad, no, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. None of this is worth it. John looked at his suffering son, and the rage on his face melted away leaving only a look of calm understanding. Brian walked over, put his arm around John, and they began to make their way through the crowd toward the church exit, with the guests flanking them. But Jason paused for a moment, looking around the hushed crowd before he stopped his gaze on Penny, agonized anticipation written all over her face. He reached into his pocket and with a smooth motion tossed the wedding ring toward Penny. It hit the tile floor with a loud clink and bounced twice before falling next to her foot. Goodbye, Penny, he said in a voice with bitter finality, then walked out of the room like a prisoner sentenced to death. Chapter 2 A Thousand Days 
Jason sat hunched over in front of the coffee table in the small living room of his apartment, chewing the last piece of cereal and staring blankly out the window at the coming dawn. He stood up slowly and stretched, then walked across the living room floor past the chair she usually read in, past the closet where her clothes were kept, and entered the kitchen where she was cooking and dumped the empty bowl into the sink. A thousand days, he muttered, looking at the empty bed, littered with crumpled sheets, evidence of another night spent alone, of bad dreams and insomnia. He stripped off his workout clothes, showered and shaved before slipping into his usual dark conservative suit, tying his tie and turning his back to his reflection in the mirror and walking out of his lonely apartment to work. A thousand damn days, he said aloud, walking across the garage to his car and remembering another, far more painful walk. That day, after leaving church, he'd essentially staggered to the car, barely able to get to it with the help of his dad and Brian. The ride home was barely bearable. His father insisted on driving and spoke to him in the most soothing tone a gruff, exhausted man could have. Trying his best to convince Jason that the world went on and that life would eventually get better. His father stayed with him for a week while Jason struggled to come back to life. First in an almost catatonic state, then incoherent, and finally in a state of sluggish depression. A thousand days, and this is still the best part of my day. Sighing, he pulled into the Prairie Tower parking garage and nonchalantly took the elevator to the 42nd floor. He made his way to his corner office, nodded to the janitors, the only people on the floor at this time, and then sat down at his desk and turned on his computer. This place was a refuge for him, a corner office where the intellectual appeal of numbers, graphs, and models could seduce and occupy his mind just enough to chase away the memories that tormented him. Memories of romantic kisses and holding hands in the park became painful because of memories of betrayal, of tearful confessions, of the gold ring jingling against the tiles to rest on the hem of his wedding dress. At the urging of friends, he had on occasion tried to step onto dangerous ground. In particular, he had five dates with five different women. All of the dates were awkward, with forced smiles and sporadic, awkward conversations, and none of them were so successful that either party even considered trying again. They all ended fairly early, even without a kiss on the cheek. After the fifth date, about six months later, Jason came to the conclusion that he wasn't ready to socialize with women at all, let alone date, and once again decided to seclude himself. And so he sat in his sanctuary, his office, his inviolate space that protected him from socializing with others, from the pain and hassle of human interaction, and from the dangers of forming relationships. It was the only place where he felt comfortable, where the idea of usefulness replaced companionship. But at the end of each day, the workday was over, and Jason had to go home to the TV, the computer, the books, and the empty, cold, lifeless apartment. And he was gradually realizing that he couldn't lead the life of a high-tech hermit indefinitely, and that even for him, some minimal socializing was necessary. So that night, instead of going straight home, he decided to do something different, to try to go to the social party Brian had urged him to attend with an enthusiasm that bordered on coercion. Leaning back in his office chair and folding his hands on the back of his head, Jason worried about the discomfort he would feel this evening, and for a moment he thought about brushing it off. But pursing his lips, he discreetly shook his head with a look of determination on his face and got up to grab his car keys. The house was large, almost a mansion, located on a street lined with other mansions. There were cars everywhere, filling the driveway, parked on both sides of the street, and two even parked neatly on the lawn. Jason put the car in a small spot a block or so away from the house and texted Brian his arrival, slowly making his way through the parked cars. When he reached the front door, Brian was already out to meet him, smiling broadly and shifting nervously from foot to foot as Jason approached. To keep him from turning around and running away, Brian put his arm around Jason's shoulders and quickly pulled him inside. Despite its size, the house was crowded with people. They crowded around, laughing, watching a baseball game, playing volleyball in the backyard, eating barbecue and drinking beer. Brian took Jason from room to room, showing him off to old friends and introducing him to new acquaintances at a brisk pace. The men greeting him with cheers and pats on the back. The women with flirtatious smiles and small talk. To his surprise, Jason was enjoying himself, and for the first time in as long as he could remember, he felt something akin to confidence when talking to women. After wandering around the house and sampling the food and entertainment, Jason and Brian became engrossed in a game of pool, which was held in the large recreation room. When Brian left to get a beer, Jason felt comfortable enough to wander around the house some more. Eventually, he made his way to the media room where he ran into Buddy Johnson, 
a pleasant, chubby former classmate who had taken up temporary shelter next to a table laden with potato chips and juice. Buddy smiled broadly at Jason. Hey, Jason. Haven't seen you in a while. What's up, man? You want some chips? There's barbecue outside, too. No. No. I'm fine now. Jason smiled back, then nodded at the big TV that was currently running commercials. What are you watching? A buddy swallowed and ran his tongue over his lips before answering. Yeah, we just got done watching the Cubbies lose in an extra innings. Buddy rolled his eyes in disgust, then continued. But it just got switched to some movie. When it's over, I think they'll hook up the Xbox to play. I think it's almost finished, so it won't take long if you want to play. Jason nodded in response to Buddy's words and stood behind the couch littered with people as the movie started again. Jason nodded in recognition, bit his lip, and began to rub his hands restlessly, recognizing the plot. It was the end of the movie The Graduate, and he was watching Benjamin Braddock, Dustin Hoffman's character, abandon his car, which had no gasoline in it, and set off on foot to frantically make his way to the wedding. When he arrived, he found the doors to the church locked and eventually made his way to the glass wall at the back of the chapel. Jason swallowed hard twice and began breathing rapidly through his nose as he watched Braddock bang on the glass and call out Elaine over and over again to get her attention, and then turned pale as a sheet when Elaine turned in response to Braddock's words and spotting him abruptly left the chapel in a burst of chaos and fled with Braddock on a bus, leaving her fiancé behind. The informal audience, which included not only those seated on the sofa, but also several couples sprawled on the floor, were clearly amused by these scenes. Two of the men, who had been drinking heavily, began shouting Elaine, Elaine as the scene played out, while the others laughed and giggled. Jason, however, found himself bent over with his hands in his lap, as if his head was suddenly foggy or even nauseous. One of the women walking by to grab a bite to eat delicately placed a hand on his back and gently asked if he was okay. He stood up, embarrassed, and looked around at everyone gathered, who were so enamored with the idea of a woman leaving a man at the altar for someone who obviously offered more. He looked at the woman, a short, olive-skinned Hispanic woman, with a concerned, uncertain smile, shook his head, and without a word, disappeared out the door. Brian walked with bated breath to the door of Jason's apartment and stood in front of it for a minute or more before he raised his hand to knock. When nothing happened, he knocked a second time, louder and more insistently. This time, a shuffling sound was heard, and then the door opened, revealing a tired and disheveled Jason Bright, dressed in shorts and an old t-shirt. Oh. Hi, Brian. What? What do you need? He asked, opening the door wider, silently inviting him in, and then turned and headed back into the living room. Brian hesitated for a moment and then followed him, turning to Jason. Hey, man, sorry to barge in on you like this, but when I call, I only get your voicemail and I wanted to talk. I just wanted to say I'm sorry about how the party went last week, with the whole movie thing and everything. You didn't need to come over to apologize. It wasn't your fault. In fact, it wasn't anyone's fault. Yes, it is. But you know I was worried about you, and I wanted to make sure you were okay. And I guess I wanted to talk and get it to you that... That... What? Asked Jason tiredly, sinking down onto the couch. Brian sat on the edge of the couch, folding his arms across his chest, and contemplated his friend before answering. That you have to move forward, Jace. You've had a rough patch, but you need to get out of it and live your life. Oh, shit, Brian. It's easy to give out advice like that but I got stabbed in the back, damn it, by the person I should have trusted the most in my life. It was the most painful and humiliating thing I've ever gone through, and it was all thanks to the woman I was in love with. How the hell do you move on after something like that? Do you have any idea what that feels like? Any idea? Brian held up both hands, as if trying to stop Jason's words, and his pain, with a simple, firm gesture. Just, just stop, Jason. Just stop. You're right. I've never had to go through anything even remotely like the emotional blow that Penny dealt you. I understand that. But as a friend who cares about you, I'm saying that you can get over it if you want to, but it's going to take some effort and some... some courage. Jason snorted in disgust. So I'm some kind of coward now because I got dumped? Is that true? Brian shook his head in despair. Come on. You know that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that how your life turns out is largely up to you. You can stay isolated and alone, trapped in this apartment like some character from Great Expectations, or you can at least try to start something new. Jason sat up, his face clenched in an expression of frustrated anger, his mouth opening and closing in an attempt to respond. 
but there were no words. And then, as if exhausted by his own emotions, he collapsed back onto the couch. Shit, Brian. I don't even know how to start. I can't even figure out what to do. Brian smirked, pulling a folded piece of paper out of his pocket. Well, Jace, Brian just might have the answer for you. He unfolded the paper and placed it on Jason's knee. Jason picked up the paper suspiciously and studied it, his eyes frowning as he read. Brian, it's just a list of girls. A list of girls who would love to go out with you. Names and numbers, all kinds of information. All you have to do is call. I've done that before, but it didn't work out. Well, it's time to do better. I don't think I can. That's what I thought you were going to say. Brian pulled out his cell phone and flipped through several screens. Here, I've been ordered to read this to you if you resist. So listen. Brian pressed a button on his cell phone and John Bright's voice rang out in the room. Jason, no one knows better than I do that you've been thrown into a worse situation than the latrine at Woodstock with all that marriage crap. And I understand why you've become disillusioned with life in general and women in particular. I do. But honestly, son, it's time to grab life by the balls and start living again. I've seen you do some amazing things, and now I'm asking, or maybe insisting, that you do another amazing thing. I want you to put all this crap behind you and start having fun. Smiling Brian has a list of girls he assures me are top-notch. I'm not sure if Brian has more than three working brain cells, but I will say this. He seems to have a knack for women. So in this case, and this case only, I want you to do what he says. You don't need to get involved in anything serious. Play the field, have fun, put your past behind you. You have too much ahead of you to live in a self-imposed prison. Jason sat on the couch with his arms folded across his chest and rocked slowly back and forth, staring blankly at the list he had placed on the coffee table in front of him. Well, asked Brian, after a few minutes of awkward silence had passed. What? Jason turned around to Brian, his eyes blinking as if he had just woken up from a bright light shining in his face. Brian let out an intermittent sigh. You're going to get your act together. Ask one of these girls out and try to start a life. Jason started to nod his head. Yeah. He interrupted him abruptly. Eh? Or are you just going to continue this slow social suicide like this? Brian waited with his hands folded on his hips, and Jason watched with a strangely amused expression as Brian's aggressive, defiant attitude was replaced by incredulous surprise. Wait, wait, what did you say? You said that, that you're going to ask some of these girls out? Is that what you said? Yeah, that's exactly what I said. Jason's voice grew sharply stronger and more convincing. My dad's right. You're right. I have to live my life. I have to move forward. Brian's whole torso rocked back and forth in a nodding motion, and he opened his arms in a welcoming gesture, his eyebrows rising in a surprised look. All right then, he said. With no rational way to decide who to start with, Jason started at the top of the list. And the first woman was the roommate of one of the girls Brian was dating. She moved like a ballerina, tall, slender, and graceful, and her lustrous straight brown hair fell over her shoulders like a silk garment. She had graduated from college four years ago, worked as a buyer at a local clothing store, and had a passion for tennis. They had dinner at a formal Italian restaurant and then went to a play. She was polite and cheerful, but the conversation was awkward and became increasingly drawn out and strained as the evening went on. Once the play was over, Jason drove her home without any objection on her part. He ended the evening with a dry kiss on the cheek and an apology. Jason spent the night tossing and turning in bed and reflecting on the night before. He cursed aloud through clenched teeth, arguing with himself about the futility of socializing. But the next morning he grimly went to the list and called girl number two. She was short and perky, a pale-skinned, freckled, red-haired girl who could strike up a conversation with a statue. She worked at the veterinary clinic as an assistant, liked to dance and skate. They went to a sandwich store, then a dance club, and ended the evening with coffee at a late-night diner. The evening went easily for Jason as the conversation flowed quickly and incoherently, discussing everything from the sorry state of the space program to the relative superiority of Labrador retrievers to their preferred style of snowboarding attire. They seemed to talk about everything and everyone except their personal romantic stories, and Jason realized later that this was almost certainly an explicit directive from Brian. Over the next two months, he asked her out four more times. A night at the ballet, a night at the movies, another night of dancing, and then a picnic in the park. He loved being with her, and she enjoyed his company, but she was an energetic girl with a busy schedule, and there was no real spark between them. 
so he gently let the relationship fade, calling and texting her, but never asking her out again. Girl Hash 3 was a free spirit. She weighed a few pounds, had light brown hair gathered in a ponytail, laughing brown eyes, and tanned skin. She worked as a research assistant in the physics department at Northwestern University, but on weekends and weekday evenings, she partied hard. She loved motorcycles, loud music, and smoking pot. Jason invited her to a rock concert. After the date was over, she invited him inside, and after a little hesitation, he accepted. The apartment was filled with the sounds of the Grateful Dead and the thick, acrid sweet smell of smoke. The roommate, tall and thin with a joint between her lips, waved from the kitchen where she was obviously baking brownies. Jason settled down on the couch, relinquished his bowl of grass and tried to act casual until he finally bowed out and drove home. At his apartment, he quickly took off his clothes and put them in the washing machine and took a shower himself, vaguely wondering if he could test positive for secondhand smoke. The next day, he called Girl Hash 4. She was something of a Marilyn Monroe clone with short, curled, platinum blonde hair. She worked as a saleswoman, still lived at home, and didn't seem to have any real interests. Jason, to whom the ability for social interaction was slowly returning, carried on a conversation as they sat down to a long and rather tedious dinner. He drove her home, and she invited him in for a drink, letting him know that her parents were away for the weekend. Her gorgeous cleavage and full hips made the invitation very tempting, but Jason couldn't bring himself to engage in any kind of relationship with such a weak girl. So he politely declined and went home, where he finished the evening with a bottle of baby oil in front of his computer. Girls five through seven were cute, outgoing, fun, but otherwise unremarkable. He enjoyed meeting them, having good conversations, enjoying laughter and easy intimacy. He made second, third, and even fourth dates, but never felt anything but pleasant satisfaction and began to worry that the relationship he had with Penny would forever slip away from him. He began to think that he might have to find someone he could be comfortable with, or maybe just love, and that deep love like he had with Penny was just not meant to happen again. But that was before girl number eight came along. Gail Ann Rawson was a 28-year-old University of Illinois graduate with a degree in marketing and a solid advertising job at a downtown department store. To most observers, she was, if not beautiful, at least pretty. Shoulder-length ash blonde hair framing a heart-shaped face, cool, lightly freckled skin, and a soft, comfortable body. She was also the only girl on the list that neither Jason nor Brian, for that matter, had ever met. Her brother worked with Brian, and when he heard about Jason, he called his sister over. Brian took one look at her picture and put her on the list. When Jason called, Gail was wary and a little reserved, even surprised that Jason had called her specifically. She vaguely remembered talking to her brother about Jason a few months ago, but now, faced with the reality of being asked out by a complete stranger, she chickened out and declined. And Jason, feeling somewhat relieved that he wouldn't have to try to impress a complete stranger, took it calmly. But a couple of days later, Gail called back and apologized for her refusal, explaining that she hadn't wanted to at first, and after talking to her brother again, she changed her mind about going on the date. They talked for a few minutes on the phone, joked about how blind dates can be uncomfortable, and made plans for a lunch date later in the week. They met at a small downtown cafe specializing in soups and salads. The conversation was awkward at first. Typical opening remarks, job and education descriptions, general information about family life, and idle comments about soup and bisque preferences. Gradually, the conversation became lighter, more casual and spontaneous. They swapped stories, talked about interests, and laughed. When they finished eating and Jason held out his credit card, he looked at his watch and was amazed to see that he was 30 minutes late for his scheduled return to the office. He hastily paid and took Gail out to the sidewalk, where he hailed a cab for her and then caught his own. Back in the office, he absent-mindedly went about his afternoon work reflecting on his lunch with Gail. Following his plan to not seem needy or overly concerned about any of the girls he'd had a good time with, Jason decided to wait a couple days before contacting Gail again. After a few hours, he decided he wanted to invite her to a play that was coming to town in a couple weeks and figured he'd better call her the next day so she'd have a chance to book the date. By late afternoon, he changed that plan and decided to call her later to invite her to dinner that weekend. He ended up calling before he even left work, and invited her the next night. She said yes. They had dinner at an upscale steakhouse, planning to go to a movie, but time slipped away from them as they chatted throughout dinner and missed the start of the movie. They lingered at the table, devoured the shared dessert for over an hour, and continued to chat after the check was paid until the waiter began to gently hint 
and then finally more forcefully suggested they move the conversation elsewhere if they were done eating, since the restaurant could use the table. Gail was shocked, but Jason only laughed, and instead of ending the evening, suggested they move their date to a nearby bar. They continued to talk about everything in the world, from clothing preferences to favorite sports teams to travel dreams. They talked seriously about important things and jokingly about humorous things, easily and with great interest, revealing any insignificant fact about themselves. One day, the conversation turned to the excessive lifestyles of the rich and famous. Jason reasoned that money and fame likely exacerbated the problems associated with poor lifestyle choices and listed several famous people. When he mentioned Lindsay Lohan, Gail snorted and rolled her eyes in disgust. God, Lindsay Lohan, how much I hate her! She said it, almost spitting the words out. Jason raised his eyebrows and shook his head puzzled. Why does she annoy you so much? I mean, I know she's out of control and beating herself up, but what makes her different from the rest of us? Gail took a deep breath, bit her lip, and looked up at the ceiling before returning her gaze to Jason. It's not that she's taking anything. In fact, I don't care about that at all. It's just that she was in a Disney movie that I just hate, and for some reason I can't help but blame it on her personally. Wait, you hate her because she was in a movie you didn't like? Gail squinted her eyes and wrinkled her nose as if the conversation had taken a decidedly unpleasant turn. No, it's, well, sort of, I mean, I really, really hated that movie. Jason tilted his head to the side, thinking about Gail for a moment. Seriously, you owe me a little explanation. How can a movie, and a Disney movie at that, be so bad? Gail let out her breath in a long, controlled sigh and leaned forward, resting her elbow on the table and resting her cheek on her hand. You're going to make me talk about it, aren't you? She smiled. Yes, he said with a half smile. Yeah, I guess so. Gail took another deep breath and exhaled slowly before speaking again. Okay. Well, the movie is a remake. The Parent Trap. The original had Haley Mills in it. Do you know the story? Yeah, sure. I think I do. Twin girls find out their sisters and try to get their mom and dad to get back together, right? Well, yeah and the horrible, horrible things they did to the girl who was going to marry their dad. Jason raised his eyebrows, and Gail leaned back in her chair, chewing on her lip as if contemplating what to say next. She shifted awkwardly in her chair and smiled embarrassedly at Jason. It, everyone liked that movie because everyone wanted the parents to get back together, and no one liked the girl that platinum blonde he was engaged to, so everything they did with her was supposed to be really funny, but... 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 Here's the thing. I really, really relate to this girl. She just fell in love with a guy and tried to marry him, and these girls are playing all these horrible tricks on her to separate her from her father. I know the movie makes her look like a gold-digging bitch, but she was just... Wait, so why do you care? You really don't know, do you? A look of undisguised surprise appeared on Gail's face, and Jason realized he'd missed something important about her past. He shrugged, shook his head, and smiled, calmly answering her question. No, I have no idea. Gail pursed her lips and ran a hand through her hair, pausing to rub her scalp before continuing. I guess I thought you knew about my story. I figured Brian or my brother told you and that they were trying to set me up with a nice guy or something. Honestly, Gail, I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, at least you know about me being with Trevor, right? I've mentioned him a couple times, haven't I? Well, of course. Jason nodded his head. I got the impression that things were pretty serious between you two. Well, yeah, it was. Gail paused to clear her throat. Anyway, he was an older man. I think I've mentioned this before. He was in his late 40s. An architect. Divorced. So, we started dating. It was very serious. And we talked about marriage. But, uh, but he had a daughter, Amy. She was 14 at the time, and she really had a thing for me. Why? She really wanted her parents to get back together. The divorce was hard on her, and I think she never got over the fact that the breakup was final. So when Trevor and I started having a serious relationship, I think she decided that if she was going to get in the way of our relationship, her mom and dad would still have a chance. And she threw a tantrum? Gail took a sip of her drink and shook her head. But a small, embarrassed smile continued to play on her lips. No. She did the parent trap thing. Lots of shenanigans. To make me look bad or bitchy. Pranks? Yeah. Jason looked at Gail expectantly. Er Oh, now you're going to make me tell you about the pranks, aren't you? Jason smiled openly, nodding his head. 
and Gail let out a short, snorting laugh and shook her head as if she couldn't believe what she was about to do. Okay, then buckle up. She took a deep breath and exhaled slowly before beginning her story. Dan the first prank I know of happened the night I was going to meet his business associates. I lost my favorite perfume and Amy came running with it just as Trevor and I were pulling away from the driveway. I didn't have time to apply them before we pulled up to the restaurant, but it turns out she'd added some horrible smelling stuff to the perfume, like raw sewage. I didn't, didn't even realize it was me until Trevor sniffed my neck and almost released the gag as soon as we entered the restaurant. I wanted to go home and clean myself up, but it was too late, so I went to the restroom and cleaned myself up as best I could, but I still think I stunk to high heaven. It was horrible. Every time someone came near me, they looked like they had just swallowed curdled milk. Oh my god, that's awful, said Jason, barely suppressing a laugh. Yeah, I just feel sympathy, she said with a sarcastic smile. But that was just the beginning. Before our next big date, she washed my underwear in the same shit and put some of it in my spritzer. She also put a few garlic capsules in my vitamins, which resulted in terrible breath, as you can guess. I told Trevor what she had done, but he remained silent. I honestly started to wonder if he thought I just smelled bad. Jason leaned forward and defiantly inhaled deeply through his nose. Well, I'm not picking up anything right now, but I'll take another sniff outside in case the smells here are masking it. Funny. She fake frowned and smiled, then continued her story. But another time, she somehow got hold of fly pheromone and smeared it on me before a picnic with our friends. Not a few minutes later, I was already swarming with little black buggers. You can imagine the impression I made as a fly lady. I was furious and asked Trevor to talk to Amy, but he just let it go. And that ruined our relationship? Almost, but not quite. It stressed me out, made me a little paranoid. And of course, it made it impossible to trust Amy or to be her friend at all. All in all, it made things difficult. But the final straw was when we threw a big dinner party, inviting his mom, dad, and a few important clients. She managed to get some kind of sedative, I think it was Ativan or something, and slipped it into my wine. By the time dinner was over, I was slurring my words and could barely keep my eyes open. By the end of dinner, I had completely passed out and was lying headfirst in my chicken. Somehow Amy managed to get the back of my dress wet, so it looked like I'd peed my pants when Trevor and another guy basically picked me up in their arms and dragged me into the bedroom. You're kidding me, said Jason incredulously. Not at all. It's the plain truth. We had a fight and he told me how embarrassed he was by my behavior and only got more upset when I blamed Amy. I couldn't deal with the lack of support and he couldn't deal with the conflict. And we broke up. Gail paused, then laughed. Straight out of Disney, huh? Maybe from sick, twisted Disney. Well, anyway, that's my sad story. She paused and tilted her head to the side, scrutinizing Jason with a curious smile. How about yours? She asked softly. Jason leaned back in his chair. Well, he began. Mine isn't Disney, but it's kind of like a movie. More like Runaway Bride, I guess. Uh, did she chicken out at the last minute? No, more like she got carried away by an old flame. Right before you were going to get married? No, right at the wedding. I was in a tuxedo, all ready to go out, humming the wedding march. Didn't think anything could go wrong and she walked in in her wedding dress and said it was over. Says she loves another guy and that we're not getting married. God, that's awful. Yeah, it is. Jason's incredulous smile widened slightly. I've already told you about my dad, how he's a pretty rough man. Anyway, he almost caused a ruckus at church. Called her a bitch, yelled at all the guests. It was chaos. And what did you do? What could I have done? I just walked away like some kind of zombie. He laughed briefly. I was a mess, to be honest. Just a mess. I think, I think this is the first time I've laughed while telling this story or even thinking about it. It just seems so, now, so far away, like it happened to someone else. Well, time does that. Time? Sure, it helps. But mostly I think the difference is you. They walked out of the bar, holding hands, walking silently down the sidewalk to the restaurant parking lot and to the car. Jason opening the door and helping Gail into the seat. He slid into the driver's seat and fiddled awkwardly with the seatbelt and ignition before turning nervously to Gail. I don't mean to be cavalier, but I had a really good time tonight. And I thought maybe you might want to spend some more time together. There aren't many places available right now, but we could go to my place. It's not that far from here. Gail turned away and stared out the window, saying nothing. 
and Jason's invitation pressed down on her like a giant, embarrassing weight. After a few moments, Jason broke the silence stiffly. Look, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you. We haven't known each other that long, I know that. So again, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. As he spoke, Gail turned to face Jason and looked him in the eyes with a direct, searching gaze. Yes, she said simply, abruptly interrupting his apology. Yes? Yes, we haven't known each other that long, and yes, I'd like to go back to your apartment. Fifteen minutes later, Jason stood in front of his apartment door, opening it wide for Gail, and simply announced, There she is, wishing he had offered something more witty. She entered the apartment slowly and stopped in the hallway letting Jason take her coat as he walked past her. Come on in and sit on the couch if you'd like. She took two small steps forward and hesitated, slowly turning her head as she looked around the apartment, giving the impression of cautious uncertainty. Jason continued, The kitchen is right over there and I can get you something to drink if you'd like, and the bathroom is right down the hall if you'd like to use it. He gestured toward the bathroom, anxiously awaiting a response from Gail, who continued to stand still at the entrance to the living room, looking around the apartment, moving from the kitchen to the living room, from the living room to the hallway, and finally back to Jason, bestowing on him the same tense look she'd cast on him in the car when she'd accepted his invitation. Jason, she said in a quiet but clear voice, just take me to the bedroom. Jason swallowed hard twice and took a deep breath before nodding his head. Sometime in the middle of the night, Jason woke up and realized that for the first time in years, he wasn't alone in his bed. Opening his eyes, Jason discerned Gail's smiling face in the dim light of the hallway lamp. Hi, she said simply. Hi yourself. Can't sleep? No. I just woke up a little while ago and I was just doing some thinking. Pondering? Thinking about what? Thinking about... What's the matter? I'm not sure I should say. A girl shouldn't always give away her plans. Plans? What plans? I'm going to make you mine. She said it as if she was stating an immutable fact a truth that couldn't be resisted or denied. Jason froze in place, eyebrows raised in surprise, and Gail waited for his answer with an expression of cheerful anticipation. You got off to a very good start, he finally said quietly, looking intently into her face. And indeed, a good start turned into a vigorous affair, a courtship that was nothing less than sensational. Everything from the places they went to eat, vacations to sex, and life itself seemed new and exciting. Their romance was so strong and intense that it extinguished all doubts and fears that could have hindered their relationship. And so they got engaged to be married as soon as possible to plan the wedding. Like everything else in their relationship, the plans and events leading up to the wedding went flawlessly, without worry or resentment. And all of Jason's worries and nervousness were relegated to the part of the mind that was reserved for the impossible. Everything seemed perfect, right up until the moment when Gail casually informed him that Trevor had contacted her and wanted to attend not only the wedding, but also some of the events leading up to it, and that she strongly encouraged him to come. Jason felt a lump stirring in his chest when she said that, but trying to appear reasonable and confident took the information as casually as possible, hoping that Gail was just trying to be polite, to be the bigger woman and allow an ex who wanted to be a friend to attend an important event. But within minutes of Trevor's arrival, it was clear to Jason that he considered himself more than just a friend to Gail, and he made little effort to hide his feelings. From the beginning, he'd begun to edge Gail out of the group for private conversations, intimate conversations in which he smiled endlessly and leaned over to exchange whispers with her, ignoring the rest of the group. And when he couldn't do that, he was always there for her, touching her, putting his hand on her shoulder or back, nonchalantly hugging her and smirking at Jason like she was still his girlfriend. But the worst part was that although Gail tried to push him away from time to time, she never asked him to leave or back off, never read him the law of disorder that would put an end to his borderline behavior. And so, less than 10 months after their first meeting, Jason found himself at his second wedding rehearsal dinner with his second fiancé. And for the second time in his life, he experienced a sense of impending doom. Because now, at this dinner, things looked worse than he'd ever imagined. Across the table from him sat Trevor, a confident, handsome, tanned man with salt and pepper hair and a spotlight smile who was engaged in conversation with half a dozen very interested ladies, a paragon of charm and tact, the center of attraction for every eye in the room, especially Gail, who seemed unable to take her eyes off him for more than a few moments at a time. And with every sly look, with every sly smile, the lump Gail had planted in his chest 
grew until it became a sort of emotional cancer that darkened his mood and destroyed his composure. He haphazardly moved food from plate to plate, barely engaging in conversation with the guests, who seemed more aware of his discomfort than Gail. Finally, with a resigned sigh, he pushed his plate away and muttered softly to himself, placing his elbows on the table and massaging his temples with his knuckles. Gail finally turned her attention to him. God, are you okay? You look a little sore. Jason looked at her with a blank, almost threatening stare, trying to decide what to say, then leaned over and hissed in her ear, the tone of his voice so angry and foreign it hit her like a fist. Damn it, Gail! If you're going to take me down, why don't you just use a knife? Gail's eyes widened in wild, frightened disbelief. What? What? What's wrong, Jason? What are you talking about? Jason snorted with a mocking half-smile. Come on, Gail. I've been here before, he said, nodding slightly in Trevor's direction. You basically invited your ex to our rehearsal without asking me. You suddenly have secrets. You're having private conversations, clearly arranging some sort of meeting or something. And now, at dinner, you can't take your eyes off him, smiling to yourself, probably about some personal fantasy. And you're nervous. I know how this ends. I've been here before. Maybe we should just move it over here, switch places. Would that make you feel better? Gail began shaking her head vigorously and leaned closer to Jason, obviously trying not to be overheard. Oh, no. No, no, Jason. You didn't. I didn't invite him. He kind of invited himself. He said he wanted to be there, that he wanted to see me. And I, well, I had something I wanted to do, and that's why I was secretive. I knew you, that you'd be mad. So I just didn't tell you. I, angry about what? Because of some last minute tryst? Why the hell would I be upset about what my fiance is doing before her wedding to her ex boyfriend and not be entertained? No. Jason, no, just, just stop. Her voice was suddenly low and insistent, the panic of a moment ago replaced by firm determination. This isn't what that you think. Jason raised his eyebrows expectantly, and Gail took a slow, deliberate breath through her nose before starting again. Look, if you wait a minute, just a couple minutes, I think you'll see. At this point, one of the women Trevor had been fawning over suddenly asked loudly, what? What's that on your... on your teeth? That's some kind of juice. Without trying to understand what the woman was talking about, Gail smiled broadly at Jason and raised her eyebrows. Or maybe you won't have to wait at all. Jason turned around with a disgruntled face at the new commotion. What he saw seemed so strange that for a moment he had trouble making sense of what was happening. Trevor was still smiling, still sitting elegantly, but now he was bringing his hand to his mouth with a puzzled and concerned look. His bright white teeth had somehow turned a disgusting dark blue color, as had his lips, and a small drip mark on the right side of his chin. What the hell is that? said Jason absent-mindedly, eyes wide. What? What did you do? We're not done yet, remarked Gail carelessly, turning to look. Not finished at all. Jason watched with frozen admiration as Trevor said something briefly to the women on either side of him and then reached for his water glass, dipped a napkin in it, and wiped his mouth before taking a drink. As he drank, however, water began to drip uncontrollably from the glass onto his chin, and the blue dye that had not been completely removed spread further down his neck and onto his white shirt. Setting the glass down roughly, Trevor raised his eyebrows in an expression of growing despair, put on an insincere smile, and gave his shirt a cursory inspection before reaching for another glass that had appeared to his right. Dipping the napkin into the water again, he wiped the shirt for a few futile moments, before touching the napkin to his lips and teeth, rubbing them discreetly. But a moment after he touched his lips with the napkin, his expression quickly changed from annoyed to puzzled, and then to mildly upset. To confirm his thoughts, Trevor picked up his glass and took a sip, whereupon his expression of frustration instantly turned to panic, and his face turned a deep red color, and his eyes seemed to pop out of his eye sockets. His appearance deteriorated further when he ran his hand mindlessly over his scalp, inadvertently turning his perfectly oiled hair into an ill-formed stack of black spikes. The final humiliation came when, in a desperate attempt to find relief, Trevor started to get up to run to the bathroom, but found that he was somehow stuck to the chair. Unable to free himself, he grabbed the nearest knife and began desperately sawing off the spot on his pants that was obviously glued to the seat, while the polite exclamations of his fellow diners grew more and more intense and turned into not-quite-polite laughter. Trevor finally stood up with a tearing sound 
and paused briefly before rushing into the restroom, wild hair, wild eyes, blue lips, and red face. In Jason's opinion, Trevor had gone from confidently handsome party leader to some kind of corporate clown in a matter of moments. Well-dressed, with a powerful circus act, an image that would be etched in the memory of Jason and all the guests present for years to come. Oh my God, that's just really cruel. I, and incredibly funny, said Jason, turning to Penny, who was watching with a look of smug amusement. Oh yes, yes it was, she replied with practiced nonchalance. Especially the last part. I didn't expect it. Jason's voice became a conspiratorial half-whisper. What do you mean you didn't expect it? That's a credit to you, isn't it? It wasn't just me. In fact, it was mostly my partner in crime. Partner? Well, yes. I needed help pulling this off, and I found the perfect person. A grown man with the heart of a 12-year-old boy. Gail nodded faintly toward the end of the table, where Jason spotted his father grinning like the Cheshire cat. His smile grew even wider when he saw the couple looking at him, and he raised his wine glass in a toast. Oh my God, said Jason laughing. What have I gotten myself into? I don't know, Gail replied, lowering her eyes and wrapping her arm around his. What did you get yourself into? Heaven. Heaven, I guess. Penny parked the pickup under a shady tree, wiped the sweat from her forehead, and cursed the broken air conditioner before climbing out of the cab. She walked slowly up the dirt concrete driveway and weed-strewn cracks to the duplex door, passing a tiny lawn with crisp brown grass and a perpetually broken sprinkler that stood as a monument to the futility of summertime. She unlocked the screen door and stepped through the open front door into the living room. The fan on the crate by the sofa was running at high speed, blowing air on her sleeping husband. She slammed the door shut on purpose, creating enough noise to make Kenny stir and open his eyes. Hey, babe, he said in a husky voice, rubbing a hand through his uncombed hair. What time is it? Penny stood with her hands on her hips and surveyed the cluttered living room. An empty pizza box and an uneaten bowl of cereal on the coffee table. A video game console on the floor by the couch. A pair of socks and a few folded pieces of paper. The TV was on, the intro to the video game was playing, and country-style music was playing on the radio in the kitchen. It's 4.30, Kenny, she said, and headed for the fan, leaning over to catch the breeze on her face. Did you interview for any jobs today? Kenny sat up straight, stretching lazily. How was I supposed to go on interviews when you have a truck? Penny stood up again and put her hands on her hips, raising her eyebrows. I don't know. You could have looked online, filled out some forms, made some calls. It's been seven months, and we're really at our financial limit. Have you done anything? Anything? Kenny held his breath, letting out an intermittent hiss. Yeah, I did something. I checked the net for available positions, but there was nothing but crap. Maybe if you work a shitty job for a while, it won't kill you. Maybe not being a nagging bitch won't kill you either. Penny's face darkened momentarily, and she covered her mouth with her hands, blinking her eyes rapidly. Kenny's facial expression softened, and he quickly stood up and walked over to Penny, put his arms around her and whispered in her ear, I'm sorry, Penny. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. It's just, I don't want to settle for some chore that doesn't pay enough. He pulled away from her a little and looked into her eyes. Just stick with me, babe. You know there's a new dealership opening up on the west side of town, and I'm eyeing a place there. We'll be fine. Just give me some space and time. Penny snorted and nodded. Okay, Kenny, okay. I'm just stressed out. My accounting job doesn't pay shit anymore, and we have no savings at all. We really need a second income. I know, Pen, I know, and I'll get it soon. Don't worry, baby. Don't worry. They gave each other a half-smile, then walked to a small alcove between the kitchen and living room where there was a desk with a computer and some filing cabinets. She sat down at the table, hovered her mouse to turn on the computer, shuffled through the papers, and pulled out a credit card to pay her bills. After a few minutes of punching in numbers, she pushed the papers aside and arching her back, yawned deeply, then returned to the computer to check the history. With a sense of disappointment and satisfaction at the same time, she noted that the list of available jobs had one search result mixed in with sports pages and YouTube videos. She glanced over at her husband, who was pulling a slice of room temperature pizza from a box on the coffee table. Want some? He asked, holding out a second, drooping slice as an offering. She shook her head. No, no, thanks. I... I was planning on going out with the girls tonight. Remember? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. He nodded and chewed. Hey, don't spend too much money, he added after he swallowed. I won't. 
She gave Kenny a warm half-smile, and he gave her a toothy grin in return, before returning to the important task of devouring the pizza. She watched her husband for a minute, and couldn't help but see him as a boy in a man's body, with his messy yellow hair, disheveled clothes, and enthusiasm for pizza. For a moment, she thought it was the same boy she'd met in junior high school over 20 years ago. Absent-mindedly, she reached for the wooden box on the shelf above the table and opened it, blindly pulling out a familiar opal pendant. She took the pendant in her hands and watched her husband for a moment, then leaned back in her chair, eyes closed, a dreamy, wistful expression on her face. But the smile disappeared when she heard swearing and slowly opened one eye to see Kenny struggling with the video game controller on the television. Wrinkling her nose in mild disgust, she frowned for a moment before biting her lip and looking at the box again. With a slow, hesitant, guilty movement, she brought her free hand to the box and carefully lifted a piece of felt-covered cardboard and pulled out a beautiful gold ring with a shining diamond. She held the ring in the palm of her hand, contemplating something, and then slipped it on her finger, secretly admiring it as it sparkled under the overhead light. Glancing around the living room, she returned to the computer and with a long, sentimental sigh, began to run her fingers over the keyboard, quickly bringing up a series of images that were familiar to her, pages and pages of material she had collected and saved over nearly a decade. Images pulled from social media, company announcements, and news articles. Images of Jason. Him surrounded by a group of businessmen in blue suits announcing a promotion. Him and his beautiful wife splashing in the waves and lying on the beach on their honeymoon in Hawaii. A family photo in front of a beautiful home with his wife, smiling Father John, and an adorable toddler with a crooked smile. The perfect house, the perfect family, the perfect life. The sound of the phone ringing brought Penny out of her reverie, and she awkwardly picked up the receiver, immediately confronted by the endlessly cheerful voice of Betsy Palmer. Hi! How's the birthday girl two days late? Are you ready for the bachelorette party? Penny thought for a moment before answering, her voice hesitant and confused. Yeah, Betsy, I don't know. I've been thinking. Our budget is limited, and... Oh, no, you don't. It's your birthday present from all the girls. You're not paying anything, so no excuses, okay? We'll all be there, the whole gang. Except Teresa, of course. Wait, Teresa can't come? Why? Betsy's enthusiasm faded for a moment. Uh, I guess you haven't heard. She's... Well, she got a second job and can't come in today. Tim's back in rehab and she has to work part-time to make ends meet, so... Oh, shit. I had no idea. Betsy glared again. Yeah, it sucks. But look, we'll do her some other time. Tonight we're going to have a blast, and you better not be late or we'll miss the start of the show. The show? Yeah, remember we talked about going to the movies, and there's a new romantic comedy with Jennifer Lawrence on. It's supposed to be really cute, but it starts at 7 o'clock so we have to have time to eat. There was a pause as Penny bit her lip in thought before replying in a reluctant and concerned tone. Is that... is that all that's playing? Well, there's also a Tarantino Western, but that's pretty much the only option. Betsy highlighted the words Tarantino's Western with a long, sarcastic stroke, clearly expressing her disapproval. Penny snorted before replying, her voice remaining quiet and unsure. I... I don't know. I think maybe I should watch a Western. Betsy's voice became incredulous, and she let out a half-hearted chuckle. Really? You're kidding, aren't you? A shooter? I didn't know you liked westerns. Me Penny pressed her lips together and looked at her husband, who was sitting cross-legged on the old rug amidst the trash and junk he'd let accumulate around him, completely absorbed in his video game, furiously manipulating the controller. And then she looked at the image on her computer screen again. Jason and his perfect little family standing happily in front of their gorgeous home. When she answered, there was a deep melancholy tinged with sentimentality and regret in her voice. Betsy, it's not that. It's not that I like westerns, Penny gasped. It's that I really, really hate romantic comedies. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.